Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. This episode contains strong language and scenes that some listeners might find disturbing. Please be advised. Why are you pacing up and down? You know why. Not still that. Look, it, I can't be undermined in the way that I've been undermined, and I need to find a permanent solution to the problem. I'm sure the production team didn't mean anything by it. They cut out one joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they did it to me, and it matters to me, and I'm going to solve this problem forever. Do you mean what I think you mean? Yes, I'm going to terminate the issue. Matt, this is serious talk. I mean, that's extreme. Yeah, but genuinely, to me now, the only solution is for me to ensure that they are indefinitely silenced, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I think I do know what you mean. Do you mean kill them? What? No, no, I'm just going to send a formal email of complaint via my agent. Yeah, that's what I said. 23rd of October, 1975, Porlock Hill, Exmoor. Driving along the dark, deserted road, Mr. Letherby struggles to focus. The windscreen wipers are going full pelt, but with the rain coming down so hard, he can't see more than a couple of metres ahead. His wife looks his way, concerned. Letherby pats her knee. As an AA patrolman, he's used to driving in conditions far worse than this. Don't worry, darling. Just a few more... His wife's scream rings in his ears as he watches a man jump into the road ahead, frantically waving his arms. Letherby slams on the brakes and the car skids to a halt, stopping only inches in front of him. Shaken, Letherby immediately asks his wife if she's all right. Then he winds down the car window. The man is soaking wet and he's staggering towards them like a zombie. Letherby's wife grips his arm, frightened, but all he feels is anger. This madman could have got them all killed. What the hell do you think you're playing at? But his anger quickly gives way to alarm as he takes the man in. He's weeping and shivering. He looks utterly distraught, and his clothes are covered in blood. Please help me. Someone has shot my dog and tried to shoot me. Okay, are you a member of the AA? (laughs) If not, there's nothing I can do. Letherby's wife whispers to him. He's clearly insane. Drive on before he tries anything. But something about how scared this man looks makes Letherby give him the benefit of the doubt. Despite his wife's continued pleading, Letherby finds himself getting out of the car and following the man to the lifeless body of his Great Dane. Letherby's heart breaks at the sight of her. The man tells him his name is Norman and that his dog is called Rinker. Letherby helps him carry her to the roadside. Watching Norman cradle the dog in his arms, inconsolable, Letherby can't help blurting out the question going round and round in his head. Who would do such a thing? Now Norman looks up at him, his expression turning from despair to anger. It was Jeremy Thorpe, the leader of the Liberal Party. From Wondery, I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. And this is British Scandal. So, Matt, we left Norman in a pretty precarious position last episode. You left us at that incredible moment where Thorpe has decided he's going to kill Norman Scott, which is just such an insane thing for a leading politician to be explicit about. And it shows just how desperate Thorpe is to fully rid himself of Norman. Yeah, particularly desperate because everything's actually on the up for Thorpe. He's leader of the Liberal Party. And in his mind, the only thing that's standing in his way is Norman and the evidence of this affair. And Norman is sort of insistent on telling whoever he can. He tells the police, the Home Secretary, even Thorpe's own mother and wife. So he's on a mission to make this known. He is, because he's desperate and he needs a national insurance card that I still can't believe he hasn't managed to get his hands on. I mean, he's fully run out of options. And from Thorpe's perspective, 
that option is way in the past. And now with time passing, it just seems like, why didn't he just sort that out? None of this had to happen. But Thorpe's got a one-track mind. He's, you know, pigeonholed himself into this one solution. And it's an incredibly violent one. It's not just incredibly violent. It's absolutely bonkers. Is he actually going to put this ludicrous plan into action? Matt, this is British Scandal. Obviously, yes. This is episode three, Shoot the Dog. December 1970, The Ritz, London. Stepping into the opulent dining room, Jeremy Thorpe takes in the twinkling lights of the giant Christmas tree, the tasteful decorations hanging from the ceiling. But he feels no joy, only bittersweet memories of his late wife. Caroline loved the festive season. He nears his favourite table overlooking Green Park, where Peter Bessel is waiting. Thorpe turns to the man walking alongside him, his oldest friend, David Holmes. Remember what I told you, David. Peter still needs some convincing. Let me do all the talking. The dour Yorkshireman pushes his thick-trimmed glasses up the bridge of his nose and nods dutifully. Thorpe knows he need say no more. Since their days at Oxford together, Holmes has been as loyal as a lapdog, and Thorpe has always suspected Holmes's feelings for him run deeper than just friendship. After a brief exchange of hellos, Thorpe gets down to business. Gentlemen, you both know why we're here. The Scottish matter. Devolution. This is the twist in the tale you weren't expecting. Before Thorpe can go on, Bessel cuts in. Jeremy, I understand how hard Caroline's loss has been, but murder? Thorpe feels a flash of anger. Of course he's grieving, and he wouldn't be if it weren't for Norman. He's been a thorn in his side for a decade. The idea of being rid of him once and for all isn't just appealing, it's vital. Thorpe ignores Bessel, turning to Holmes. What about poison? David, you could chat Norman up, take him back to your place, then offer him a drink from a lethally laced flask of whiskey. Holmes looks alarmed. Thorpe concedes. Refinements may be necessary. Research slow-acting poisons. Thorpe runs through more options including a car accident or putting Norman in the middle of a robbery gone wrong. He then suggests disposing of the body by throwing it into one of Cornwall's disused mines. Holmes sighs. The thing is, Jeremy, I can't help thinking that Peter's right. I worry that you're not thinking straight. Thorpe feels like he's stepped into an ambush. His stomach tightens as he realises what's going on. This is an intervention. Bessel starts to talk again. Look, I know I haven't been as on the ball regarding Norman since I moved to New York, but I made contact a few days ago. He's shacked up with a widow in Wales. He expressed great regret about speaking to Caroline and gave his word that he would not cause any more trouble. Holmes chips in. And say we did this... If it led back to you, what would happen to Rupert? Thorpe's blood runs cold at the mention of his 18-month-old son. The poor lad has already lost his mother. If anything went wrong with their plan and Thorpe went to prison, who would he have left? How has he not thought about his son before? Yeah, and instead of just saying, Jeremy, don't kill people, murder is wrong. Don't do a murder. They have to find some strategy. Well, we'll have to bring his family into play because otherwise he'll never realise that murder's wrong. And it's also really telling of the man that his own comfort and his own convenience is the only thing that is feeding this. As if sensing Thorpe's doubts, Bessel pushes. You must forget this idea. Concentrate on your future with Rupert. On the future of the party. Put all your fight into reaching number ten. Like you always said you would. I'll keep tabs on Norman. Make sure he behaves. Thorpe sighs. Perhaps his friends are right. Instead of directing all his energy at a pathetic figure like Norman, he should focus on what he's always done best. Winning. From now on, murder is off the menu. The greatest way he can honour Caroline's memory is to pursue the dream they both shared. Him reaching Downing Street. (laughs) 
I love the idea that the way to honour your dead wife's memory is to actively not kill your ex-lover. And become Prime Minister. <laughs> it's what she would have wanted. Six months later, May 1971, Talibant, Wales. Norman places a mug of tea in front of Gwen Parry Jones, sits down opposite her at the kitchen table of her small cottage. He has to fight to keep his nerves in check, but he's determined to do this. He's been dating Gwen for four months, and it's going well, but he knows he needs to tell her, be honest with her. I need to tell you about a relationship I had with a man. Gwen is silent as Norman spells out the details of his affair with Jeremy Thorpe. Then, he waits for her to respond. When she looks at him, it's with an expression of horror. Norman feels the now familiar shame rise inside him. He'd hoped Gwen was different. But when she finally speaks, it's clear he's not the focus of her outrage. You were just 20 when he did this to you. It's appalling. The man is a sex fiend and a liar. You must report him. I've tried that. Nobody cares. I've even told his mother, the police. But Gwen cuts him off. The party would care. I've been a liberal for years. His behaviour goes against everything they and I believe in. Norman's own experience tells him the contrary. He shakes his head. They won't listen. They're not interested in helping me. Just themselves. No matter how hard Gwen tries to convince Norman he's wrong, he won't budge. Finally, she storms out, slamming the door behind her. Norman thinks about going after her, but decides the best thing he can do is give her some space. Instead, he walks across the muddy fields to the stables. After an hour's riding, Norman's head feels clearer. Gwen may be angry now, but when she calms down, she'll understand why he wants to leave this be. He doesn't have the energy to fight anymore. He just wants to be open and honest. By the time he returns to the cottage, he's pleased to see the lights are on. Gwen has come home. But stepping inside, Norman is thrown by the presence of a stranger beside her. Norman, this is an old friend of mine. I need you to listen to what he has to say. The desperation in Gwen's eyes makes Norman agree. He sits and waits. Gwen has told me all about what happened between you and Jeremy Thorpe. I think his behaviour could cause untold damage to the Liberal Party. It troubles me deeply, not least because my own son is a sitting Liberal MP. What are the chances that Norman's new squeeze is a member of the party and her mate is the dad of a Liberal MP? The podcast gods are shining down on us. What a lovely narrative twist. Surprised by that, Norman listens more intently as the man goes on. I hope you don't mind, but I've already called my son and explained the situation. He's very keen to meet with you and offer you his help. You may have heard of him. His name is Emlyn Hewson. OK, that's the guy who stood against Thorpe for the leadership. They are rivals, essentially, and he knows about the affair with Norman. If you remember last episode, he rather cryptically and threateningly said to Thorpe, aren't you worried about the little matter of the man in Dublin? Of course, meaning Norman. He has that intel already, but he just doesn't have anything to back it up. So this would be the ultimate evidence. One week later, Westminster. Emlyn Hooson straightens his tie, adjusts his suit jacket... If he plays this right, he could finally get Jeremy Thorpe out of the closet and, more importantly, the party. He's always known that Thorpe had something to hide. He's a poisoned apple at the centre of the party. If he can finally expose him as a liar, he'll get a clear shot at leader at last. He's chairman now, after all. He's next in line. So he's in a way better position to weaponise this information. Oh, yeah, he's as close as you could get. Hooson welcomes Norman and Gwen into his office. He's taken aback by how withdrawn and distant Norman looks. The boy has a limp, clammy handshake and is sweating profusely. He barely makes eye contact. Gwen speaks up first. We really are so grateful that you'd agree to see us. It's wrong that the leader of the Liberal Party should behave in such a way and face no consequences. Hooson nods 
but he needs Norman to be saying this, not his girlfriend. He takes a sip of his water and rises to his feet. Hoosen is trained as a barrister and knows how to break a witness down. He begins pacing the room. Mr Scott, could you tell me in your own words exactly what took place between you and Mr Thorpe? At last, Norman meets his eye, but he's morose to say the least. Is there any point? Whoever I talk to, nothing ever changes. Norman draws his knees up to his chest, rocks on his chair like a scared child. Hoosen inwardly despairs. The boy is a mess. But Hoosen senses he wants to talk, wants to expose Thorpe. He changes tack. I just don't believe any of this could have happened. Jeremy Thorpe is a man of honour and the highest morals. For you to slander him is frankly despicable. Norman stares back at him, stunned. Hoosen wonders if he's gone too far. But now, when Norman speaks, it's with anger, conviction. I have letters from Peter Bessel, letters he sent alongside retainer payments, or what I prefer to call hush money. So he was getting some money? Yes, he was, although if you'll remember, this is all linked to that national insurance card that Thorpe wouldn't get sorted for him. So instead of arranging that, he arranged for Bessel to pay him these monthly retainers which were just the bare minimum for him to stay alive, really. It was the benefits he would have got with his national insurance card. Call me naive. Wouldn't it have just been easier to get him a national insurance card? Yeah, from where we're stood now, it does sort of look that way, doesn't it? I suppose the reasons for it being arranged this way were twofold. One was when they were in a relationship. Thorpe just wanted constant access to Norman, and if he was indebted, he knew that was guaranteed. And the other thing was a paper trail. He was paranoid that this would get out, and so he did it all through Bessel. But this is way more complicated than any of that would have been. Where is my national insurance card, by the way? How do I ensure that you come back for the next episode? Houston brightens. Finally, something concrete. Do they mention Jeremy Thorpe by name? Norman looks back at his lap. No. Houston's heart sinks. But the police interviewed me back in 1962. I gave a statement explaining our whole affair... They also have love letters Jeremy wrote to me. Hoosen feels like punching the air. This is real, concrete evidence. He has contacts with the police. He's sure he can track the letters down. And if he does, he'll be able to crush Jeremy Thorpe once and for all. Two days later, May 1971, Westminster. Thorpe is in a chipper mood as he enters the office of Chief Whip David Steele for their regular morning meeting. But he's thrown to see Emlyn Hooson sitting beside Steele. The man is only ever in Thorpe's orbit when he's bringing trouble. Morning, Jeremy. I'm afraid I've been forced to come to David with a rather grave accusation. Thorpe feels a discomfort take hold as Steele launches into a familiar list of accusations Norman has come out with over the years. But it doesn't take him long to regroup. Thorpe has had to spin his cover story so many times, he's almost convinced himself it's true. Norman Scott is a chancer and a fraud. A long time ago, I helped him gain employment following his stay in a mental institution. To Thorpe's dismay, Steele looks dubious. The thing is, Jeremy... It's not how I perceive such things. What matters is how it will sound to others. Mr Scott also mentioned that letters you wrote to him are with the police. Thorpe feels his palms sweat. His collar seems to tighten. Hoosen delivers the hammer blow. We have no choice but to look into this further. Leaving Steele's office, Thorpe is reeling. He has to make sure that if an inquiry happens, nothing can be found. Later that day, at Scotland Yard, Thorpe sits with the Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Sir John Waldron. Their meeting has been set up by the Conservative Home Secretary, a good friend of Thorpe's. He can only hope that Sir John is as accommodating. Thorpe shifts uncomfortably in his seat. Emlyn Hewson seems intent on rummaging around, seeing if he can stir up something. He clearly hopes that if I'm forced to resign from the leadership, he'll have a chance himself. It's all rather unseemly. Thorpe waits with bated breath, 
He's never met Sir John before now. He has no idea how he'll respond. His heart thuds in his chest. I took the liberty of looking at Norman Scott's file before our meeting. He does sound like a rather troubled young man. The Met has no details of his psychiatric history, but we are more than happy to take a statement from you, filling in the gaps, as it were. Thorpe immediately reads between the lines. He's been given free reign to portray Norman as a deranged fantasist on record, thus completely discrediting anything Norman has said to the police, including the existence of any letters. That really is incredible. He is effectively allowed to change this guy's police file to fit his version of events. And not just give his version of events, but change the official narrative. The next day, Thorpe stands in Steele's office and smugly waves a letter at Hooson. It's from the Home Secretary, stating that he and the Metropolitan Police are happy to accept Thorpe's version of events. Steele almost looks relieved. Hooson struggles to hide his fury. Thorpe knows he'll be forced to let this go. But leaving Steele's office, Thorpe also knows it's not enough. He was a fool to let Bessel and Holmes talk him out of finding a more permanent solution for the threat posed by Norman. This business proves he'll never be safe while that man is breathing. Thorpe's plan to murder Norman Scott is back on. And this time, he won't let anyone change his mind. In 1991, Bakersfield, California, two boys stumble upon a grisly discovery, the body of a young woman. In the Shadows, the new podcast from Wondery Plus follows the ensuing 32-year ordeal to uncover those responsible and bring them to justice. It was a mystery that riveted a desert town for years. Police immediately zeroed in on her longtime boyfriend, a beloved star athlete. Despite national attention and several trials, a conviction of the perpetrator remained elusive and many thought it would never be solved. During the investigation of In the Shadows, several individuals revealed shocking information previously unknown to authorities. Ultimately, this new insight turned everything on its head and will bring you one step closer to deciding who's responsible for the murder. You can listen to In the Shadows at... Hi, I'm Lindsey Graham, the host of Wondery's podcast, American Scandal. We bring to life some of the biggest controversies in U.S. history, presidential lies, environmental disasters, corporate fraud. In our newest series, we look at the story of the Oklahoma City bombing, the deadliest act of domestic terrorism in United States history. On April 19, 1995, a moving truck packed with 4,800 pounds of explosives was detonated in downtown Oklahoma City. When the bomb went off, it killed 168 people and injured over 600 more. At first, both the American public and law enforcement believed international terrorists were behind the attack. But the evidence led investigators toward an unexpected and chilling conclusion. The Oklahoma City bombing appeared to be the work of domestic criminals in a plot bound together with political extremism, conspiracy theories, and a goal to strike back against the United States government. Follow American Scandal wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. June 1971, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Peter Bessel winds down the car window as he drives down the narrow, unlit road. The sticky night air provides little relief from his growing sense of foreboding. In the passenger seat, David Holmes looks equally sombre. Bessel suspects it's because they're thinking the same thing. It's not every day you go searching for the perfect spot to hide a dead body. The road soon turns into a muddy dirt track. Bessel pulls over. They've reached his chosen spot. He and Holmes step out into the darkness and Bessel shines his torch at a nearby swamp. Holmes nervously looks at his feet. Did you say they had rattlesnakes out here? Despite their predicament, Bessel can't help a wry smile. It's plain you were not cut out for murder, David. Holmes smirks. Sure about that. He pulls a gun from his pocket, pointing it Bessel's way. Bessel's stomach drops. What the fuck? 
don't worry, I got it from a toy shop. Thought it'd help me get into character. Bessel slaps the gun from Holmes's hand and inwardly curses. Bessel thinks Holmes is a fool and he's starting to question his own plan. There's something inherently comical about these two being dispatched to America to commit murder. This is all deeply sinister. However, it's also sort of ridiculous and I maybe would watch a TV show about them. One's from the North, one's from the South. Both love murder. This is Holmes and Bessel. (laughs) Over the past few weeks, Jeremy Thorpe has once again become obsessed with the idea of killing Norman. Sure, it's still the grief talking. Bessel is desperate to save Thorpe from himself. So he's cooked up a plan. They'll tell Thorpe they were about to kill Norman, but the plan went disastrously wrong and they had to abandon the idea. He needs to show Thorpe how dangerous this is for him, how it could destroy his life. Already needing to go to Florida on business, Bessel realised the state's miles of uninhabited swampland could make the perfect location for murder. That's why they're doing a recce of the big cypress swamp in the dead of night. Focus, David. You'll need to describe this place to him in detail if we have any hope of making him believe us. The pair spend the next hour studying the area, before driving back to the Holiday Inn in West Palm Beach where they're staying. There they go through their story again. Then Bessel dials Thorpe's number in the UK. Jeremy, I'm afraid things didn't go to plan. Bessel explains how he flew Norman over to Florida on the promise of a job with Holmes playing the part of potential employer. Then Holmes lured Norman to a meeting spot in Fort Lauderdale, where he spiked his tea with a sedative, put him in the boot of his car, and drove him out to the swamp. Handing the phone over, Holmes then describes how he opened the boot to find Norman was awake. I tried to shoot him, Jeremy, but he pleaded for his life, and I'm afraid he managed to escape. Holmes stops talking, waits for Thorpe's response. Standing at his shoulder, Bessel holds his breath. Unable to stand it any longer, he grabs the receiver. Norman called me an hour ago. He was terrified. He knows you mean business now and swears he'll never bother you again. I'm certain he meant it. We've done it, Jeremy. We've scared him off for good. There's a long pause. All right, Peter. I suppose we shall... Have to leave it at that. Bessel could collapse with relief. He can only hope that as Thorpe's grief fades, so too will this crazy idea. They all need to move on with their lives and put Norman Scott firmly behind them. Three years later, March 1974, New York City, In the dining room of the Plaza Hotel, Bessel beams as Thorpe approaches. They hug warmly, then Thorpe takes his seat opposite at a table overlooking a snow-covered Central Park. It may not be the Ritz, but I think you'll agree the view's just as good. Not bad at all, Baselli. It's a long time since Thorpe has used that nickname, and it warms Bessel to hear it. He's had a tricky few years, with one doomed business venture after another. And while he's found personal happiness by remarrying, he misses all the trappings of power he enjoyed alongside Thorpe as an MP. So he was delighted when Thorpe suggested they meet while he's here on holiday. Bessel is keen to hear all about Thorpe's new wife, a former concert pianist called Marion, who also happens to be the Countess of Harewood. I thought the Countess might be joining us, Jeremy. I'd love for you to meet her, but she insisted on going shopping... I think it's important for a couple to pursue separate interests. I myself had a little stroll around Central Park last night. Amazing what delights one can find there. I don't think he means the street food. All those people painted all in silver who stay very still. Thorpe winks at him. Bessel smiles. There's something comforting about Thorpe being back to his old tricks. It seems his grief over Caroline, and in turn his murderous intentions towards Norman, are firmly in the past. But when Thorpe starts talking again, the conversation takes a familiar turn. I saw Norman a few weeks ago in Devon. He's still very handsome. Couldn't take my eyes off him. 
Bessel's heart thuds. He tries to sound casual in his response. Well, what did he do? Nothing, just trotted off on his horse. Haven't seen him since. I take it he hasn't been in touch with you. Bessel can hardly hide his relief. No, not for ages. Thorpe nods and starts tucking into his melon starter. Bessel allows himself to relax. You know, Baselli, the party's been doing very well of late. Number ten is no pipe dream anymore. It's a very real prospect. Thorpe lifts his eyes from his plate, fixes them on Bessel. I can't let anything jeopardise that. Especially not Norman. We must fix it. Thorpe raises his hands and mimes the action of breaking a neck. Bessel almost chokes on his smoked salmon, but Thorpe looks deadly serious. We'll get a professional this time. Make it quick. You know what I saw in the boy's eyes that day? Despair. Come on, Baselli. We'd be putting him out of his misery. It's no worse than shooting a sick dog. This is appalling. It feels as well, like at one point, Norman posed a threat to him. But now there's been a period of quiet where he's been distant and yes, they have this chance encounter. But really, he's not that same presence in his life as he once was. So why does this obsession continue? And it's not like he's reducing risks in the rest of his life. He's still behaving in largely the same way. All he cares about is becoming prime minister. And the closer he gets to that, the stronger the desire he has to eliminate any threat to his rise rather than perceiving a huge risk that someone who is involved in murder may not become Prime Minister, his calculation is this will make it more likely. Bessel feels his stomach churn. He'd humoured Thorpe when he spoke of killing Norman before, but that was three years ago. Thorpe is no longer grieving. For the first time, he looks at Thorpe and sees him for what he really is, an utterly ruthless operator who will stop at nothing to get his own way. He takes a gulp of his champagne and looks warily at his old friend. I'm not a killer, Jeremy. If you insist on pursuing this crazy idea, you'll have to do it without my help. I'm sorry. Thorpe fixes him with a scowl. I am asking you, as a friend, to help me. By saying you won't, you are rendering our friendship meaningless. That's a price worth paying. As ultimatums go... If you won't murder this man for me, you won't be on the Christmas card list. I mean, it's not something you need a minute to think about, is it? Either kill this guy for me or I cut all ties, implicating you no further in anything that happens next. (laughs) Bessel can't believe it. He's hit with the realisation that Thorpe sees him in the same way as he sees Norman. A disposable pawn that has outlived its use. He considers Bessel a lackey, not a friend. A wave of nausea hits him as he wonders if he's putting himself in the firing line by saying no. Would Thorpe do to him what he's so keen to do to Norman? Bessel can't allow himself to think about it. He looks Thorpe directly in the eye. The answer is no, Jeremy. Thorpe calmly stands up, then walks away without so much as a goodbye. It takes every fibre of Bessel's will not to call after him, tell him he's sorry. After all, Thorpe's been his closest friend for a decade. But he knows that's over now. As he watches Thorpe leave the room, he knows he's doing the right thing. And if Thorpe ever does come after him, Bessel has plenty of ammunition of his own. He won't hesitate to use it and get Thorpe before he gets him. Eighteen months later, September 1975, Westminster. Thorpe furiously bangs his fist on the desk as David Holmes glances around the room sheepishly. Ten thousand pounds? How the hell am I supposed to get that? Sorry, Jeremy, I'm told that's the, uh, going rate. It's been a torrid few months for Thorpe. Back in March, a hung parliament was declared. The Liberals missed out on a coalition government by a whisker, pipped to the post by Labour. Having got so close to power, Thorpe was devastated. And if that wasn't bad enough, a few weeks ago, Norman turned up at his house while Thorpe was out, telling Marion about their affair and begging for money. 
Thorpe had immediately tasked Holmes with finding a professional to deal with the wretched boy once and for all. But he had no idea murder was such a costly business. £10,000 is way above his budget. Dismissing Holmes, Thorpe ponders his next move. He'd have to mortgage his house to raise that kind of cash. He shakes his head. He can't do that to Marion. Instead, he wonders if he can siphon some money through the party. A few hours later, he ushers in longtime friend and liberal donor, Jack Hayward. With another general election coming up, Thorpe has an excuse to ask for funds. I really think that with a concentrated campaign, we still have a shot at power, Jack. We just need the backing of loyal believers like yourself. Faced with Thorpe's well-rehearsed spiel, it doesn't take long for Hayward to get his checkbook out. They agree on a figure of £17,000. Hayward starts writing a check made out to liberal election funds. Thorpe's head goes into a tailspin. He's not the only person who has access to that account. If a chunk of cash disappears, questions will be asked. He stops Hayward, tries to sound as casual as possible. Actually, I wonder if you could make 7000 out to the election account and 10 to my private account. It might be wise to keep some of this money back. The campaign team is prone to throw cash around like there's no tomorrow. Hayward hesitates, but only for a moment. He dutifully writes a second cheque. Later that day, Thorpe arrives at a remote holiday cottage in Devon. Holmes is waiting. I have secured the funds. Have you put things in place? Holmes nods. There's a fellow called Andrew Newton. He'll meet... Thorpe holds a hand up to stop Holmes going on. He's heard enough. If he's to keep his hands clean from here on in, he can't know anything else. Just make sure it's done right this time. September 1975, the Savoy, Blackpool. Dressed in a smart dinner suit, Andrew Newton strides through the vast ballroom and sits down at his table. A scantily clad waitress brings him a glass of brandy. Newton strokes his moustache as he looks her up and down. Then he lights a cigarette and bellows at the array of topless girls parading on stage. Oi, oi, nice tits. A group of men jeer loudly in support. Liberal Party conferences were wild back then. (laughs) Beckoning one of the topless girls towards him, he picks up the meringues that came with his dessert and tries to stick them on her nipples. She angrily slaps him across the face. Newton is about to retaliate when a friend hauls him to his feet. All right, chicken brain, that's enough. He drags Newton off to a table in the corner. How much have you had? Newton smiles, indicating too much. His friend sighs. I told you, I need you sober when you hear this. It's a bigger job than you're used to. Newton tries to appear more focused. He's always up for a bit of extra cash. His friend glances around, then lowers his voice. I've been approached by a representative of Jeremy Thorpe. You know, the MP. Newton stares blankly. Politics isn't really his bag. His eyes are already moving back to the girls on stage. His friend slams his hand on the table, angrily hisses at Newton. Listen, he's willing to pay cash in return for killing some nuisance bloke. Newton lets out a laugh. Petty crime is one thing, but murder? (laughs) That's not my thing, mate. You need to find someone else. Newton wobbles to his feet. He's not going to listen to this anymore. There's ten grand in it for you. So wait, £10,000 gets you a random person that's never killed anybody before. What do you pay for an actual assassin? Oh, that's the premium package. Okay, fine. Newton pauses, then thuds back down into his chair. That's more money than he earns in a year. His head swims with the possibilities. Before he can stutter a response, his friend is pushing a package towards him. A down payment. Newton pulls it open. He lifts out a bundle of cash, runs his fingers through it. There must be at least £2,000 here. And at the bottom of the bag, 
A gun is nestled in the money. His heartbeat quickens. This is crazy, but it's so much money. And with the rest, he'd be rich beyond his wildest dreams. In his drunken state, Newton starts to wonder, how hard can it really be to kill someone? Without casting aspersions on his skill set, he doesn't seem like the most together guy to carry out this assassination. I think you're right. Assassins tend to be cold, aloof characters, not drunks bowling around strip clubs, putting meringues on boobs. Twenty third of October, nineteen seventy five, Coombe Martin, Barnstable. Andrew Newton checks himself out in the wing mirror of the Ford Cortina he's hired, flicks the end of his moustache into a perfect curl. In his black polo neck sweater and khaki anorak, he's sure he looks the part. He takes the gun from his pocket, quickly stuffing it into the glove compartment. Looking at it still unnerves him. Newton reminds himself how rich he'll be when this is done. He looks into the mirror again, gives himself a pep talk. You can do this. Your name is Peter. You're a hitman. You can do this. Earlier, Newton tracked Norman Scott down to a pub where he's renting a room. Ringing him there, he told Norman he's a private investigator called Peter Keane, hired by a good Samaritan who wants to protect him. Then he informed Norman that a hitman from Canada recently arrived in the UK with the intention of killing him. Now he's waiting outside the pub to collect his willing murder victim. It's almost too easy. After a few moments, a slightly scruffy man emerges. Newton gets out of the car, waves him over. But then an elderly woman follows him out, a great dame trotting beside her. She looks Newton up and down before handing the lead to Norman. Newton is filled with horror. He has a phobia of large dogs. This one is the size of a small pony. You can't bring that! Norman strokes the dog's back, looking affronted. She's my dog, Rinka. She wouldn't hurt a fly. Newton eyeballs him, unwavering. But Norman is clearly determined. If she's not coming, neither am I. With no choice, Newton relents and waves them over. He watches as Norman leads the dog into the back seat and sits beside her. Newton eyes them in the rearview mirror as he starts the engine, desperate to get to their destination as quickly as possible. An hour later, day turns to dusk as the car crawls up Porlock Hill towards the open moorland. Rain begins to fall, worsening as the car climbs higher. Newton is driving towards an uninhabited spot on Exmoor, which he'd marked out earlier. But the heavier the rain becomes the harder it is to see where he is. Panicking, he starts to lose control of the car. It swerves from one side of the road to the other. I can't see a bloody thing. He eyes Norman in the rearview mirror. His face is full of concern. Why don't I take over? I know these roads well. The last thing Newton wants is his victim driving the car. But then he gets an idea. In these conditions, if they pull over here, no one will see them. He can kill Norman now. Get this over with. He brings the car to a halt. Newton waits for Norman to jump out with Rinka. He takes the gun from the glove compartment, gets out. He can see Norman is already soaked from the pouring rain. At his side, Rinka starts to growl, then jostle towards him. It's the jolt Newton needs. He releases the safety catch, points the gun at the dog and pulls the trigger. Norman's hysterical voice rings out in the darkness. What have you done? Newton watches as Norman falls to his knees, pulls Rinka's lifeless body into his arms. Newton wills himself to walk over to him. He feels sick, but it's now or never. He pulls back the safety again, presses the barrel of the revolver against Norman's skull. It's your turn now. But when he goes to pull the trigger, 
Nothing happens. It's jammed. Norman jumps to his feet and runs into the darkness, leaving Newton in the rain, dead dog at his feet. He wipes his brow, looks out towards the moors. Newton knows he has no chance of finding Norman out there. He screwed this up. He looks towards the sky and yells, Fuck it! Fuck it! Fuck it! Fuck it! Newton can't seem to stop repeating the words. Time seems to slow. But then he sees a figure running towards him. It's Norman, hands held in the air, screaming. Come on then, do it. Newton can't believe it. He fumbles to take the safety catch off again. Then he tightens his finger around the trigger and steadies himself. All he has to do is fire this gun and the job will be done. Norman Scott will be dead. Didn't you hear me? I said, do it. Newton's arm starts to shake uncontrollably. He drops it to his side. He can't do it. He runs back to the car, spins it around, and speeds back down Porlock Hill. As he does, he tries not to think about what will happen next. How the man he was supposed to kill is not only still alive, but will be able to identify him. Later that night, Minehead Police Station. Norman eyeballs the detective sergeant sitting opposite him. Two hours ago, he was driven to Minehead Hospital, where the doctors ascertained that he was uninjured, but in a state of shock. From there, he was brought here, where he explained as calmly as possible that Jeremy Thorpe had not only tried to have him killed, but was responsible for taking the life of an animal. Yet again, he's run through everything that's happened since they met. And yet again, the police seem unwilling to believe him. Forgive me for saying this, Mr Scott, but your story sounds a bit too fantastic. Norman stares at him, aghast. Why on earth would I make any of this up? The detective flips open a file on his desk, glances over the first couple of pages. So your first stay in a mental asylum was in Oxford 15 years ago. Uh, Seems you've been to quite a few since then. Norman sighs. He should have known his mental health record would come back to haunt him. Then he remembers something. I want my phone call, please. The detective reluctantly leads Norman to the nearest phone. He nervously dials the number of the pub he was staying at. The landlady, Edna Friendship, answers. Before Norman left earlier, Edna had been concerned about him going off with a stranger, so she took down the registration of the car. Norman shakily explains his situation, but Edna is quick to reassure him. Don't worry, Norman. I'll come down there immediately. They'll have to look into it. Hanging up, Norman starts to relay what Edna has said to the detective. But the DS isn't interested. Instead, he leads Norman to a police cell. Norman can't believe it. You're locking me away like a common criminal. I'm the victim here. Struggling to sleep on the cell's cold, hard bench, Norman can only hope Edna's evidence confirms his story. The next morning, he's hauled back into the interview room. He's greeted by the same detective as before. I take it you spoke to my landlady? Traced the car? We did. It wasn't hired by a Peter Keane. It was registered to an Andrew Newton. Ring any bells? Norman is utterly confused. He's never heard of Andrew Newton. But of course the man would give a false name. He told me his name was Keane. I'd never seen him before yesterday. The detective sits back, folds his arms. We spoke to him. He said the pair of you had a fling. Then you tried to blackmail him. He admitted to the gun, said he just wanted to scare you, and it went off by accident. He made no mention of Jeremy Thorpe or anyone else. Said this was between you and him. Norman is horrified. It's a pack of lies. Worse, the police seem to have bought it. You're lucky I don't charge you with wasting police time. We've got real crimes to solve, Mr Scott. People like you make me sick. Norman is too stunned to respond. He can only sit in silence as the detective exits the room. 
ushering in two more officers as he goes. They close the door after him, pull Norman up from his chair. They take it in turns to bang his head against the wall, laughing as they do. By the time he's released, Norman is a bloody mess. Oh, this is absolutely beyond appalling. It reminds me of the conversation he had with Gwen when she's so insistent that he calls the police, that he tells people in positions of authority. His whole life, he's been abused by people in power. And so he knows he's so reluctant to engage with these agencies because he knows that they're not on his side. He staggers out of the police station, feeling lower than ever. Sitting on the steps, he overhears a nearby reporter interviewing some youths about a petty crime. With a surge of defiance, Norman gets up and stumbles over. He introduces himself, tells the journalist he has a story for him. Norman has tried the police, the Liberal Party, Thorpe's nearest and dearest. The establishment has let him down. But the press has the power to blow this whole thing open. And Norman isn't going to rest until everyone knows exactly what a lying, murderous monster Jeremy Thorpe really is. Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. This is the third episode in our series, The Murderous MP. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatisations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read A Very English Scandal by John Preston, An Accidental Icon by Norman Scott, Rinkgate, The Rise and Fall of Jeremy Thorpe by Barry Penrose, and In My Own Time by Jeremy Thorpe. I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. Wendy Granditer wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Sound design by Rich Evans. Script editing by James Magniak. British Scandal is produced by Samizdat Audio. Our associate producer is Francesca Gelardi Quadrio Corsio. Our producer is Millie Chu. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our executive producers are Theodora Leludis, Stephanie Jens, and Marshall Louis for Wondering. <laughs>